Australia. Morning, morning, all. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm going to be successful today. Yeah. It's going to be a great day. If I was any more excited, I would just poop my pants. Um, I don't know how often I can hit that lesson, guys, but genuinely, the energy you put into stuff determines the results you get out. Simple as. I can rephrase that in 50 different ways, but it's the same shit every single time. The more energy you put in, the more energy you get out. People are, are as prone to thermodynamics as anything else. So, um, thank you for all of the feedback that came through the, uh, through the community. Much appreciated. I'm not quite up to date because I do occasionally have a weekend. Um, but I'll make sure everything's finished off by the end of today. Um, there's a couple of things I wanted to sort of mention which are sort of rel related to the feedback that, that you kind ladies and gentlemen gave me. Um, the first is a really simple one, which is the more you look like you're selling, the less you will sell. End of story. People love to own things, have things, buy things, use things. They hate being sold to. Yeah? I know people who go onto Amazon and despise the recommendations that Amazon throws up. Yeah? Because, oh, I'm being sold to. How dare they? You went on the site looking for shit. They've just recommended particular flavors of stuff. Yeah? But the general rule is, the more you're selling, the less it'll work. So if you're, if you're reading something and you think, oh, that sounds salesy, stop it, change it, get rid of it, rephrase it, yeah? Because one of the other things that, that um, was mentioned by a couple of people is that um, my approach, both the words I use and the process I use, doesn't often seem like I'm selling. You know, I make a connection with somebody, I give them a week or a fortnight before I go back to them. Apart from, thanks for connecting, which is as quick as I can. Apart from that, I'll give somebody a week, a fortnight, before I go back to them with any kind of DM about having a conversation. Why? Because we all hate being hit up immediately by somebody. Yeah, um, I, for some reason, I'm being hit up by people in Thailand at the moment on LinkedIn. I get outsourced, but not that behave yourselves. I get I get outsourced services in Thailand hitting me up. Actually, some of them are. Um, I get uh, outsourcing services in Thailand hitting me up at least once a day. Going, oh, you know, recruitment process outsourcing. Do I seem like I need an LPO service? Really? It's but. Connect, boom. Or alternatively, my personal bet are the in the mail. Because the moment I see an in mail, I just go, oh, they don't know me, I'm not interested. So my entire process is designed, and all my sales and all my conversations are all designed to be, or rather to appear as unsalesy as possible, but to achieve the maximum amount of sales revenue. That kind of makes sense, that, that opposite. Um, there's a reason I call my business the Influence Academy. And prior to that, my recruitment firm was Influence International. The reason for that is that influence is far more effective than persuasion. All the, the conventional, traditional sales training all the shit that you've seen or heard about or stuff that you've, you've seen in movies, the, the, the boiler rooms and if you're familiar with boiler room, you know, but, but boiler room, Glen Gary, Glen Ross, all the sort of videos that people show, all the films that people have about, about sales, they're all about doing it wrong. It's all about persuasion because persuasion is logical, it's rational and it's resistible. Yeah? Um, if, you, if I'm seen to be pushing you, the first thing you do is push back. If I attack you, you defend. That's just basic human nature, animal behavior. So 
why would I try and push you? Why would I try to attack you? Why would I even try and pull you to do something? When if I use the right processes, I can turn it into your idea. Make sense? I was talking with Joe last week about um, uh, an old contact of mine. I gave him a call, had a conversation. Um, he's not directly related to the industry that I'm in. No, not to the niche I'm in now. Um, it's an insurer. It's not directly related to the niche I'm in now. It's related to a niche I was planning to be in about 12 months from now. Once I've nailed this one, expand sideways, maximize one niche before you go into the next one. Having said all that, I just couldn't help it. So I had this conversation with the chap. Well, going backwards and forwards, I asked him a few questions, sort of dropped a few stones in the pond, let the ripples take effect. Um, mm -hmm. At the end of the conversation, um, I preface it by, I preface the last little bit of the conversation by saying, hey, you know, I'm sure that the way you're working with your, your talent acquisition team and um, the, the list of suppliers you're working with at the moment, I'm sure that's all going great for you. Um, you know, and then I left this massive pause before I went into the next part of the question, and he just kind of went, "No, nah, not really." How do you mean? <coughs> well, you know, yeah, they're, they're doing the job, but I'm, at any given time, I'm looking at my um, dashboard at the moment. Any given time, I'm looking at seventy open vacancies in this particular role. Like, oh, oh, fair enough. Okay, that was it. That was my, my pitch, was me saying, okay. We spoke on the Thursday. Friday morning, I got the phone call saying, um, do you think you might be able to help us? I've been, been pondering since we spoke last. Do you think you might be able to, able to help us out with those? I don't know, John, I'll have a look at it. Yeah. So we're potentially, I'm just looking at logistics and stuff like that. So we're potentially sat on 70, a rolling 70 open vacancies average salary 50 grand yeah, by me not pitching. Now I'm not suggesting that asking for the deal is a bad thing. But what I am saying is you catch more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. The more you look like you're selling, the less likely it is that you'll get the deal. So all the stuff that we're talking about, everything from the thank you for connecting which in my case, you either, if it's for the academy, you get a free cold calling script. If it's for my recruitment business, you get a funny gif of a cat going, mm -hmm. and thanks for connecting. Yeah, That isn't what most recruiters do typically, which is exactly why I do it. Because then when I leave it a couple of weeks and send out, a, hey, I've had an idea, I'd love to get your opinion on it. I get close to 20% of people going, yeah, okay. Or, oh, what's that about? Yeah. So yeah, I, it doesn't often look like I'm selling. And that's kind of the point. Because if I'm not selling, if I'm not pushing, they don't push back. If I'm not pulling, they don't dig the heels in. Does that all make sense? Yeah? That's kind of the, the uh, to be grandiose about it, that's the philosophy. Okay? But what we've been doing is the, the technique, and I, I became very conscious that without understanding the philosophy aspect of it, the technique kind of doesn't necessarily fit in, and that's my fault. I should have explained it before we went on. Having said that, I'm not sure you'd have understood what I've just said if we hadn't done the previous bits. So, um, let me give you an example. Um, setups. Okay? I did, we did the homework last week about setups. Um, most of us did the homework last week about setups. Um, those, those of you that haven't been able to do it yet, let me just give you one thought, which is you can't complain about not getting results from the stuff you didn't do. Um, but with the setups, there's one common mistake that everybody makes. Everybody, not, not everybody in this group, everybody full stop, which is we try and crash in. We try and do as, minimum, as minimal setup as possible and then we crash in with some variety of a sales pitch, some variety of a sales question. If I could find you one of these nice shiny things, would you want it? Could you be more salesy? 
you know, if I found you one of these, it's exactly what you're looking for, and it, they're, they're, they're cheap and they're brilliant and they outperform the market, would you look at them? Oh, really? Really? If I gave you the keys to a Porsche for free, would you want them? Probably not. I'd want to know what the, what the catch was. Yeah. Um, I mentioned this in, a, in one of the videos on my YouTube thing. I, I didn't, that made me we test everything to, to destruction. So um, my, when I had the sales training business years ago, some colleagues and I went on to Regent Street in London. If you know Regent Street, yeah, we, were, we were kind of um, just around the corner from Nike Town, opposite where the Apple store is. And we were on the corner there, um, kind of deliberately sat outside the S3 offices um, because you had to, really. So, um, and we were trying to give away £20 notes on Regent Street. Yeah? Try it. It's impossible. Nobody will take a £20 note off a stranger. They just, they just won't do it. Like, oh, God, we actually had the police called on us at one point. We were trying to explain to the police officer that it's a psychological experiment. Into what? Well, it's like... Uh, Anyway, there is a trick to giving away £20 notes. So once we found out what the trick was, we stopped that really fast because it was getting expensive really quickly. But you literally can't give away £20 notes if people feel like you're trying to get something out of them. Yeah. So the setups, um, all of that, by the way, is the setup to what the point I'm about to just make. I've been doing that massive ass setup. Most of you are nodding away while I'm doing it. Yeah? A couple of you are like, I won't nod at anything that bastard says. Under any circumstances, I'm going to get, I'm going to act like I've got a neck brace on. Um, that's fine. I can see your fingers going. The, <laughs> the challenge is most people try and do their setups really short, really fast, and then do all the work with a question. Yeah? Like um, multiple choice questions at the end, or massive ass questions with three or four clauses in them, or a really sharp angle kind of by now thing. I do the exact opposite, and I'm going to recommend that you do the opposite. The bigger your setup is, the shorter and simpler your question can be. Yeah. So hopefully I can use this today if it's work if it's going to play ball. Hang on. It's turned off. <laughs> okay. So there we go. Sorry? To what? Uh, rapport. We, if, you, if you just walk up to somebody cold and go, go on 20 pound note, they go, ah! If, you, if as they're walking, you kind of tap along at the same sort of rhythm they do. So as they're walking, you walk at the same rhythm as them, and you kind of hold your body the same way they do, and you go up and say, hey, do you want a 20 pound note? Boom, instant, yeah? So, uh, oh, it's, like, it's, it's like the, um, where is it? Where's the source button, source? There you go. Yeah, it's like the, um, the yeah, it's like the Darren, uh, Darren hey, Brad. Well, uh, well, <laughs> yeah, it was. A, it, yeah, what I wouldn't do is, is tell anybody the time in London. Like, no, not doing that. Yeah, you know that. You know that presumably. Yeah. Anybody asks you the time in London, it means they want you watch your phone. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because if you got off, if you got off phone. You've got the time. If you, it's, it's London. There's clocks everywhere. So anybody that asks you, the, asks you for the time in central London, you don't know. Just as a guy, lad. Yeah. Same way. In, in, if you go out in central London, you never wear a decent watch. You just don't. Yeah. Because the chances of you getting back to your hotel room without any kind of molestation are slim to none. Yeah. Love London. It's a shithole in some ways. But there we go. Um, anyway. Priming phrases, they're sort of thinking about, okay? Um, they are designed, as a quick list of examples, so they're designed, thinking about, looking back on, looking forward to, reflecting on, focusing on, when you think about, when you remember, if you imagine, if you could design, all of those 
kind of prefacing phrases. All of those are designed to get somebody to focus on what, they're, what you want them to focus on. And a truth set, which I, I think I might have kind of slightly flown by yesterday, uh, sorry, last week. If, um, if you do a summary of what you've said and what's happened or the account history or whatever's gone on, people will automatically agree with it. But that's not the only way you can do it. And this is, this is let me just flip, signpost this for you. This is everything about the way I work. This is everything about the way I work. Basically, when I'm trying to talk with somebody, what I'll try and do is give them as much chance to agree with me or say yes as possible, and to make it as difficult as possible for somebody to say no or disagree with me. Because the more I can create this level of agreement, the more somebody will agree with me, the easier it is and the more likely it is that they'll keep agreeing with me in the future. Does that make sense? Yeah? Right. Replay that. What I try and do is to make it as difficult as possible. I didn't say impossible. I said as difficult as possible for someone to disagree with me. I'll try and make it as easy as possible for someone to agree with me and as difficult as possible for someone to disagree with me. Because generally speaking, the more somebody agrees with me, the more likely they are to keep agreeing with me. Or the, the more they disagree with me, the more likely they are to keep disagreeing with me. And then I finish that off with a little tag question, does that make sense? That entire thing is a truth set. But it's only a truth set because I avoided one thing, which is absolutes. If I say things like everybody, everybody knows that, everybody's trying to save money, everybody's trying to get more for less. No, they're not. No, they're not. Some people, some people buy private jets, some people drive, some people generally own, rather than renting by the hour, Lamborghinis. Yeah? Absolutes will tend to kill you. Think about what I just said. Well, no, think about the way I just said that. Absolutes will tend to kill you. Yeah? I didn't say they will, I said they'll tend to. If you use absolutes, it's easier for somebody to go, no, there's an exception to that. Please notice I didn't say they will. I didn't say everybody always will. I just said it's easier for somebody to go, oh, no, there's an exception. If I give you an absolute, it's almost human nature. People almost, it's almost human nature. People almost want to push back and find the exception or go, well, no, I'm not like that. So just listen to the way I'm using the words, not just the words I'm using, but the way I'm using them. We talked the other week about tonality. Just listen to my voice inflection. Just think about the words I'm using and the way I'm using them. So I'm using what's called a downward terminal. I go down at the end of a sentence, which means it's a fact, it's a statement. It's something you should listen to. If on the other hand, I use a rising terminal. So I say, if I, you know, a lot of people will. Most people do. You might have found that. It's, that's a rising terminal. It's either a question or it's uncertainty. Now, certain accents are more prone to go up at the end. Uh, most Australians. Um, bits of Essex and Norfolk. Yeah. A lot of Liverpool, yeah. Not all, it's, it's bits of, yeah. Um, that, that is a, in most languages, not just English, but in most languages, an upward inflection at the end is a question. That makes sense? Do you know what I mean? If I use that downward inflection, it's kind of a, almost a command that you, you should agree with me. Whereas a question, you, you can agree, you can disagree. 
It will almost always make me sound a bit weaker and a bit more uncertain. Joe, you couldn't click the heater off for a sec before, before everybody goes. <laughs> There's, there's no trans induction here, but everybody's still nodding off a little bit. So just be aware of those two things. Um, if I give you this example, okay? um, this is from a, uh, a sort of non-recruitment example. Um, you mentioned earlier that you'd updated your CRM system last year and that at pretty much the same time, you also had, had a few products to the range. Uh, both those went pretty well and you'd pretty well and you'd like to keep the momentum going or if possible even accelerate it great so thinking about the year ahead that's the that's the priming phrase yeah thinking about the year ahead now what I've done is I've run them through everything that's happened over the last year and then I pump prime the pump with thinking about the year ahead that priming phrase focus phrase what kind of improvements you're looking for. If I just come out with what kind of improvements you're looking for, nothing. I get it just bounces off. Yeah? Don't worry about the word for word, I'll send you the PDF of this. Um, just an attachment when we finish. It surely doesn't matter if you put that at the end. The primary phrase at the end of the um, but that has to be some if it's going to be a question, you kinda do. You kinda have to because it's it's gonna um, it's gonna be followed up with a question yeah so thinking about has to lead into a question which can be open or can be closed but I tend to use open and big ass open questions what would you be looking for what do you want to improve what do you want to get better what do you want to do better how would your life be better yeah oh no no not that that's really salesy If general rule, if you can imagine a salesperson saying it, don't. Yeah. If you can imagine a salesperson doing a particular thing, flip it 180 degrees and do the opposite. If for no other reason than that if you do the same as everybody else, firstly, at most you'll get the same results as everybody else, normally less, but also you get bracketed with everybody else. Yeah. Now, the second part of the, the philosophical aspect, which is a very grandiose way of putting this, um, but the second aspect of it is, um, if I come across as a salesperson, people won't buy. If I come across as a recruiter, well, they may buy, they may not buy, but I'm competing with their internal talent acquisition team and their own personal network. If I'm a professional advisor, if I'm the accountant, the lawyer, the KC barrister, yeah, if I'm the McKinsey consultant that brought in to justify a decision that they plan to make anyway, I've got different perception. I get a different response and action. Yeah? If you're a professional advisor, you will always get a better um, response from people than you will by being a salesperson. If you're a professional advisor on HR issues, you, you're bracketed differently to being someone that flogs some people. Yeah? There's putting bums on seats and there being an, there's being an advisor. Yeah? And a lot of the positioning is just two things. It's your tonality and it's the way you set up your questions. It doesn't even need to be the questions themselves. It's the way you set them up. Um, I went off on this bit of a rant last week on social media. Um, most of it hasn't been released yet. You'll see it over the next week, so if you follow any of my stuff. Let me rephrase that. Um, it'll come out over the next week, so if you follow my stuff. Um, anyway, um, the, the rant I went off on is people never need more closing technique. You don't need to close your deals better, you need to open them better. Because if you open them properly, the closing is just kind of obvious. It's the obvious next step. Yeah. But most people don't do that. Most people do a really crappy job. They don't set the questions up. They ask really obvious sales questions. 
They don't build rapport. They're always asking things like this, so they sound really weak, but they're not really sure what they're saying. They're always a bit ever so humble. They're always a bit kind of, oh, if you don't mind, if you wouldn't mind giving me five minutes to have a conversation. You get the tonality right and you set your questions up right and you're a professional advisor. And then you just have to put a fee in front of them and ask for the deal or summarize your way into the deal. That's the, that's the, the end, here end of the philosophical bits. Okay? But I think that'll sort of fill in why I'm doing stuff the way I do it. Yeah. Because I'm trying to do the exact opposite of selling stuff. I want my customers and my candidates to convince themselves that what I'm going to suggest for them anyway is a good idea. That's the influence part rather than the persuasion part. That's why I don't have the persuasion school. Yeah. Okay. Because these, these setups, you, you're planting things in people's heads. You're dropping stones in the pond, as I said, gave you the metaphor the other, the other week. You're painting a picture inside somebody's head. Now, in the context of a question, the context of a sales question, context of a, a conversation, you're painting a picture in somebody's head, and then you've got to ask them a question about what they've painted in their heads. Yes? This is yes, this is no, this is, I have got no clue. You're painting a picture in their head and then you're asking them a question about the, the picture. Yeah? yeah? Right. What happens to the picture afterwards? Is it like it never happened? Or does it stay in there? It goes all blurry, but it's still there. Yeah? And the more often you come back to it, the more it embeds and the clearer and tighter it becomes. Yeah? So you can't... You've seen, you've seen Inception, the movie Inception. Yeah. Everybody in the world has seen Inception. About two people understood it. But um, the whole point of Inception is once you put an idea in somebody's head, it can't be undone. That's what that is. That putting an idea inside somebody's head and letting it grow and develop. So don't... I know if you're doing a bit of homework, you want to try and get the fewest possible words and type as few keystrokes as possible. I get it. But in real life, or if you want to do this really well, the longer, the more within reason, the longer and more comprehensive your setup is. By the way, that was me adjusting back, by the way. If I just said the longer and more comprehensive, somebody, would have, somebody might have gone, Oh, hang on, I can't do a 500 word essay just to set up a question. Yeah? Now listen to what I just said. Somebody might have said, I'm always trying to make my language as, um, how can I put it politely, slippery as possible. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to make my language as unabsolute, that's not a word, as lacking in absolutes as I possibly can, like that as I possibly can, yeah? Because if I don't give people a reason to say or think no, then the chances are they won't. If I give people a reason and a chance to say yes, the chances are they will. This is gonna start sending you nuts, by the way, if I keep signposting it. The chances are that they will. If I give people a chance to, the chances are that they will. No absolutes, it's just, it's true. If I give some, if I, yeah, the chances are that they will. That's a truth. It's not an opinion. It's a, yeah. It's not something you can agree with or disagree with because it's not a, it's not a, um, an absolute. So, I'm, to some degree, I'm stacking up the likelihood that you that someone will agree with me. I just did it then. Did you hear me do it? I'm st I started to say I'm stacking up the chances that you are stacking up the chances that someone will agree with me. Okay? Because if I say I'm stacking up the chances that you'll agree with me, you might go, no, you're not. Piss off. Okay? But if I talk about this mythical someone, I'm stacking up the chances that someone will agree with me. That's easier to agree with than if I'm talking about you. 
Yeah? I know, it gets a bit deep bendy mind flip if you're not careful. You kind of go, ooh, okay, I'm going inside my head and thinking about that one. Didn't you? That's the importance of this. This is actually my sales technique in a nutshell, to be honest. All I'm trying to do is to build up the probability of someone agreeing and decrease the likelihood of them disagreeing. And if I do that often enough and consistently enough and paint the right pictures in somebody's head, it becomes easier and easier and more and more likely that the end becomes, if not inevitable, at least much more probable, at least much more likely. And that's the game. The work? Go on. So, what about the opinion of like, don't ask, don't ask, you don't get. So if you scroll oh, I'm with that all over. Just slightly. Yeah. There. So yeah. Kind of improvement if you'd like to see. Yep. You're getting a chance to understand what the need is. Yes. Then you have to, surely you have to pitch the ability to solve that problem. Solve that. Um. I guess you're saying no, no, uh, on the next call. not really. No, what I'm saying is, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't let somebody be consciously aware that I'm pitching them. So let's say, I'll give you an example. But this is what I was planning on doing a week on Monday because I love you to bits. I'm not coming in on Easter Monday. <laughs> yeah. um, so what I was planning on doing next week is this: the way of closing it off which is I would summarize back to you what you've said and what we've agreed on, yeah? And then they say, oh, you know, but well, because of that, what we could do is, well, because of that, how about we do the other? What do you think? Does that make sense? So I, that's my pitch. My pitch is you've said you've got problem A, B, and C, and we've discussed that the best way of solving problem A, B, and C is to do one, two, three. Okay, well, great. Well, in order to solve question, in order to solve that, why don't we do this? Yeah. So I've got a call this afternoon. Um, not particularly important. It's about seven hundred seven hundred grand's worth of business. So I'm not keyed up for it in any way, shape, or form because it's just another Monday, you know. Oh. Um, What's that high-pitched squeaking noise, Stephen? That's my sphincter contracting. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so the, the way that's going to go is um, basically uh, we're going to go through all their issues and what they're trying to solve and why they've got the issues and what they need to put in place in order to make those issues go away. And then I'm going to summarize all that back to them How's this for sticking your colours on the mast? Um, I'm going to summarise all that back to them. And then I'm literally, I'm not going to put proposal. I never use the word propose. I suggest, I'll say things like how about or why don't we? Okay. And what we're going to, how, the how about is going to be, well, how about we map out all the skills that you know, your, your best people have got. And then we work back from that to work out, you know, we've got the key skills, we've got the competencies, we've kind of got the personality traits that you need. What we can then do is work out <coughs> alternative places to find those things because they, they can't get enough recruits of who are in the industry already. So how about we try and find alternative places to find those skills and competencies and then we jointly look at how we put some together some kind of attraction package. How does that work? That's going to be my pitch. My pitch is literally, you've told me all your problems, you've told me how you want to solve it. My pitch is going to be, how about we make your problems go away by doing this and we give you what you want by doing that. That's the full extent of my pitch. No slide deck. No big thing. Once the chief execs decided that this is what we're going to do, I'm sure I'll get a call into the slide deck to HR and a couple of the other people. But that's fine. Hang together at all, mate. Yeah, because yeah, I, I mean, the, I, the, the struggle is um, offering that solution if you are necessarily an expert. Okay, you can paraphrase me, you like, 
who just thrown a man from the and said that yes, you're showing understanding, but you're not necessarily showing the fact that you are the answer to that. Mm. There's a there's a one big presupposition there, which is a good thing, but the a presupposition that you've said is that um, you're assuming that the answer hasn't come up in the conversation, that the solution itself hasn't come up in the conversation. Quite often, people know what solution they need. They're just too busy to have gone off and found it. Yeah, They'll often, they'll often say that they want, well, I guess what I really need to do is this, <clears throat> but they just haven't done it yet. Yeah? Is that not the close then, if you're saying, yeah. but if the solution's come up in the conversation, yeah. you're saying, this is the solution. Yeah. And then that's not just simply just not saying the obvious, I can fix that. I don't, I should, well, I'm prefacing with, well, why don't we do this then? The, the, which assumes that I can fix it for you. Because so I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be suggesting that I fix it for you if I, if I can't fix it for you. In your call, you never say, oh, I want to fix it, then I can go and find people to fix it. You never actually pitch. Um, yeah, and uh, we're getting a we're getting a um, we're getting a labelling issue. We're getting a categorisation issue. What I just demonstrated is a pitch and a close. It just doesn't sound like it because most people are waiting for. Well, we've got fifty four years experience and we've hunt, recruited sixteen thousand people and we've done this and we've done that and we've done the other. That to me is not a pitch. That to me is just restating your credentials. That's non-persuasive. That is pushing or pulling at somebody. Yeah. So it's it's not that I don't do that. It's just that the way I do it is under the radar. Yeah. Because if I'm suggesting that we do this, this, and this, the assumption is, well, if I'm suggesting that we do this, this, and this, I must be able to do it. Yeah. What I can do, I don't I don't want to get into this too heavily because this is another session. But um, what I can also do is add some more becauses in. So I, what I could say is, oh, you know, what, what, we, what we could do is, well, how about we do this, this, and this? And then I can say, because what we've done in the past is, yeah? And then I'll just nick Joe's experience and your experience and just throw them into my explanation, yeah? So in reality, it's a pitch. It just doesn't sound like one. I'm saying, here's your problems. I can fix them for you because I've done it for other people before. It just doesn't sound like that's what I'm saying, but it actually is. But I'm doing it in a way that's really difficult to bounce off because it doesn't hit you like that. It kind of goes like this. Because it kind of fits with what you're already wanting and what you're already doing yeah don't get me wrong if somebody if, if somebody asks for a physical stand up on your feet and do a slide deck i'll blow the bloody doors off yeah of course i will mm. but i i don't think i've been asked to do that more than once in the last decade because yeah. that normally means i don't know anything about you i don't know what your capabilities are i don't know how you solve our problems so come in and do the slide deck thing come in and do the pitch deck yeah Whereas if I can solve your problems, demonstrate how I can solve them, and then close that conversation off, I probably won't need to do the pitch deck thing. So I'm, I'm crashing it a little bit because that's a whole other yeah. session. But you, you're both right. You, you're both absolutely right. It's just a, a categorization thing. What, what you're calling a pitch, I don't do. What I do, I think of as a pitch but most people wouldn't see it that way. Yeah. I present my case as the solution to your problems without making a big song and that's about credibility and history and all that sort of good stuff. I'm conscious that I may have lost a few people on that point because it's coming, leads on from what we're doing rather than it fitting into this spot. So. You might not have the the pieces in in your head yet to fit those things together. By the way, just replay what I said. I'm conscious that I might have lost a few people because you may not have the pieces. I didn't say I have. 
because you don't. I'm saying I might have because you may not. Okay. Now, um, I did this for a um, well-known recruitment company, very well-known um, tech recruitment company, one of whose founders has recently been on a celebrity TV show. Um, <coughs> And their point was, oh, you, you just sound like you're wishy-washy. You just sound like it's all a bit weak. It's not. It depends on your tonality. Okay? If you go, oh, well, well, how about we do this then? That's piss poor and wishy-washy. If you say, well, how about we do this then? Yeah? Because I guarantee that a king's council getting paid 10 grand a day does not turn around and go, well, well, let me make you this massive pitch about the case I'm going to make. Yeah, they just say, right, I've been through this before. What we need to do is this. And they're just very matter of fact, and they're very commanding in their tonality and their delivery. They don't need to make a big pitch about their idea because, well, you're paying them 10 grand a day to be there. You may as well take their advice. Yeah. They're the one that's been in court, you're not. That's why I'm saying what I'm saying about the um, tonality and the philosophy bit of it. Yeah? Okay. So, uh, let me move on a little bit from this. Okay. Um, end of last session, I was talking about that was going to get on to pain. Yeah? I was planning for this entire session to be about pain, but we've got distracted into various things, which I think have been useful. I've certainly enjoyed them. Anyway, uh, that's what matters at the end of the day. Um, but if you look at um, how you get somebody to make a change, okay? if you're trying to get anybody to do anything, they'll only do it for one of two reasons. And this, this is not new stuff. This is like platonic logic. Ancient Greeks, probably earlier than that, but we don't have the written versions to know. But people seek pain, they move towards, sorry, probably didn't slip. People seek pleasure and move away from pain. So they move towards pleasure and away from pain. Yes? We do stuff because it feels good or because it makes the headache go away. Yeah? Um, and you can turn that into literally anything. People change job, people change suppliers, people buy a watch, people change shoes, people get a different car, people move house, people anything. People live with the person they're with, they choose to go off and find with somebody else. All of it is because either they're moving towards pleasure every Monday or away from pain, but actually that makes it sound like it's binary. It's, it's normally not. It's some combination of the two. You're moving, you're moving towards pleasure and moving away from pain. That's the reality of most things. Yeah? Now, if you want to make a positive change in your life and you don't, it's normally because you've associated more pain with the process of changing than you have with the Positive, uh, then you have positive stuff with the outcome. Yeah, I, I, I've, I've been through that. Yeah, I've associated more pain with not eating the food and moving around more than I have with making the change. Okay, well, that that stops now. Okay? Um, I used to be a professional athlete, for God's sake. Yeah, I used to fight for a living. So what? Oh, so I watched Jake Jill and all yesterday, enough's enough. Um, so the challenge that people have is that most traditional sales is all about one thing. What's it about? What do, mo what do most people's pitches consist of? Yeah, it's, it's a solution. Here we go, <laughs> pleasure, 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 pleasure. Yeah. And the customer goes, oh, yeah, but I'm really happy with my current supplier. I've got an internal TA team. Hang on, you've got existing suppliers and an internal TA team and you're sat in 70 vacancies at any given moment. The hell are you talking about? 
is what I could have said, uh, but obviously didn't, because I'm ugly, but I'm not stupid. Feel free to defend me on the ugly bit, any time you like. <laughs> so that's the, the problem with what most people do. We sell the benefits. You come across that expression? Sell the benefits. Problem is, most people don't give a toss about the benefits. What they want is to make their problem go away. The benefits are how we make the problem go away. Yeah? The benefits are what they'll have once the problem's gone away. But most people, most of the time, are not fixated on the pleasure, on their goals, on their future. They're fixated on the brown, smelly stuff that they're up to the neck in right now. Yeah? If you look at if you look at any organization, if you look at this organization, yeah, um, depending on who you're talking to, some people are primarily um, toward pleasure, um, like Kev, for example. Kev being in a position now where he can look at, oh, I want to achieve this and do this and do and achieve the other, okay. Whereas, you know. Poor old Joe, poor old Joe's, yeah, I'd love to achieve this, but right now I've got this massive bucket of brown stuff. Yeah, let me find a way of shoveling this. And then I can and then I can look at the future. Yeah. That's yeah. It, it it's not a question of seniority. It's a question of where you where you're at in your career, in your problems, in your project, in your situation, in your whatever. Yeah. Um, it's also a lot to do with your psychology. Because some people are what we call toward motivated. They, they think primarily, mainly, about what they're trying to achieve. Language again, think primarily, mainly. I didn't say only, or they're focused on, or they just think about. Yeah? And other people are mainly away from motivated. They're focused on moving away from their problems and their issues. Now, some people are only one or only the other. Most people are some combination of the two, but have a tendency. Yeah? Um, what I've found, I'm going to simplify this massively just for the sake of example. Most people um, want to be toward motivated. Most people want to be driven towards their goals. They want to achieve their things. They want the life of their dreams. They want the people in their life, they want the career, they want the holidays, they want the stuff, yeah? But they sit there all day not doing the stuff that will actually make that happen. Yeah? I'm not pointing at you, by the way, that's just, I'm vaguely pointing in that direction of that wall. Yeah? Um, but they sit there all day not doing stuff because the pain of where they are right now isn't big enough to make them take action. So what I've found with most people is that they can be motivated by the towards, by the good, happy, sunny stuff, but they take action because they reach a point where they're not going to put up with it anymore. Yes? Think about anything that you've done in your personal life. I would suggest that in most cases, you hearing this yet? I would suggest that, I won't say, I will tell you, I will suggest that in most cases, when you've made a change in something significant, it's because you reached the point where you wouldn't put up with it anymore. You reached that threshold point where it wasn't a single thing, it was just suddenly, oh, shit, I'm not putting up with this anymore. By the way, just to demonstrate there's a bit of method to the madness. Do you remember a couple of weeks ago I told you about the couples counselling that I used to um, be a therapist in? Used to, yeah? And I gave you the example of people reaching the point where, oh God, they put the big jars where the small jars go, or they squeeze the toothpaste in the middle, it sends me fucking nuts! Remember that bit? Yeah. That was a signpost for this bit right now. There is a bit of method in the madness as well as madness in the method. Because when you get to the point where you won't put up with it anymore, it doesn't take a big pitch, gentlemen. It doesn't take a big pitch, it doesn't take a big close, because you're just pissed off with them squeezing the toothpaste from the middle. 
all you need to suggest is that, well, I always squeeze it from the bottom. That normally works better. Oh, I love you. Yeah. It just needs a little shift because they're already there. Yeah. But if you're dealing with somebody who's, you know, they've been together 20 years and, you know, it's all, it's, it's a bit crap, but it's not that bad. There's no impetus for change. There's no drive. It just kind of plods along and it's not that bad. It hasn't killed me yet. You know, they're all right. It's all right. So in a sales context, in a, in a recruitment context, what we're doing is, let me go back here a little bit, positive and negative framing questions. Yeah. Oops, let me get around there. Let me get around that. Thank you for pointing it out. Everybody else is thinking it and saying nothing. It's obviously got a timer on it, hasn't it? Which is a tad annoying. Okay. Um, going back on yet or not? Oh, goodness sake. No, it's not having it. Okay. Let me do this the simple way then. Um, Positive framing questions and negative framing questions. Um, a setup <coughs> comes before a question. Yeah, the questions you ask are then one of three things. They're either positive about the yellow stuff, they're negative about the brown smelly stuff, or they're neutral. Okay. If I say, "How was your journey in today?" You could say just about anything. It was fine, you know, fine. That's what most people's response would be, fine. Which, depending on who you are, either stands for feelings inside, not expressed, fine. Or it's fucked up, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. Either one works. Um, but fine, okay? If I say, what was the best thing about your journey today? What would you say? Best thing about your journey today? What do you say, Drew? Uh, I did not have to take a bus. Okay. So it might not be a big positive, but it'll be a positive. I'll take it. Okay. Um, what was your worst thing about coming in today? What was it? What was the worst uh, thing about coming in? Road. <laughs> <What> a, <laughs> Stay at the road. Stay at the road. Okay. Because, uh, yeah, I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> okay. S silly. Silly demo, by the way, but just, yeah. You say the road. I didn't jump in with the multiple choice questions. Do you mean it was too busy? Do you mean there were potholes? Do you mean it was da 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 da? Which most people, not you, but most people would do. They'd immediately jump in with multiple choice. Okay. What I did instead was go, yeah. Which is a non verbal way of saying, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> and you filled in the blanks. Thank you very much indeed. It's the road. <laughs> Conor McCormack book? What are you talking about? Okay. Um, oh, we have a screen. Here we go. Um, so for any situation, you can ask a positive. What's the best, easiest, simplest, quickest, cheapest, most profitable? Or you can ask a negative. What's the worst, hardest, most difficult, slowest? most expensive. You just change a couple of words and a question either gets you lots of sunny yellow stuff or it builds you a bucket full of brown stuff. The setup is exactly the same. <clears throat> Thinking about you don't, you know, what, you might, what you want to achieve this year, how you're doing so far, what you might need to change, what you need to double down on and do more of, which as I'm thinking that, I didn't even give you any context, but you're probably already starting to think about it. And then I would just ask you either a negative or a positively framed question. I always try and avoid, like the plague, any neutral questions because I've no idea what the hell I'm going to get. If I say to somebody, what are you trying to achieve? Uh, I 
don't know really or oh what i need to do is to get rid of all my people and automate everything well, that doesn't help me does it i'm a recruiter yeah, unless i'm doing outplacements yeah so what's the most important changes what do you what do you want to do less of this year yeah i can just change make a couple of little changes and make it either all about the good stuff that you want to achieve or all about the brown stuff that you're trying to avoid yeah. and here's the, the important point um, I'm assuming that you're all familiar with the concept of, of rubber bands you know the rubber bands on the death yeah rubber bands <laughs> if you push at a rubber band it just sort of sits there and it's boring if you pull at a rubber band it's still boring it's just a different variety of boring if you get a rubber band and you pull it and you push it and you aim it and you let go that's a much more interesting object yeah. if you push it in one direction and you pull it in the other all you need to do is then trigger it Ding! slap yeah. and that's what the positive and negative framing questions are about so I'll set up the question and then I'll try and get you to talk about what you want to achieve, what you want most, what will make your life easier and better, what will make your company more profitable, what will make everything about what you do easier, and what challenges are you having? How long have they been going on for? What's the implication of that? How, is that, how much is that costing you? More and more and more and more about the negative stuff. And again, most traditional sales doesn't talk about this. Most traditional sales training never, you know, oh, you don't want the customer thinking negatively. Yeah, you do. You absolutely do. You want the customer thinking negatively about where they are, their current solution, and their current suppliers. You absolutely want your customers thinking really serious, heavy brown stuff about what they're doing now and how they're doing it. And you want them thinking bright yellow golden stuff about making a change and what you could do and how it would help them. It's just naive to think that you can purely sell the benefit. Well, no, that's not true, actually. You can purely sell the benefit. It's naive thinking that you'll maximize your sales, sales results that way. Because that's just not how people work. People work from a combination of toward and away from. With me on those? Okay. Um, I'm about 10 minutes shy of where I was going to finish up. So I'm going to, I'm going to stop there. I'll bring it back next time we're together, which is going to be a week on Monday. Okay. So um, let me just summarize quickly with um, three key points. The first is I know the temptation when you're doing a written exercise is just to keep it all as concise as possible. My first suggestion is don't. My first suggestion is make it as thorough and comprehensive as you can do without just becoming a waffle monster. Yeah. It should sound conversational. It should sound chatty. If I went upstairs and just listened to you guys talking around the, around the office, I guarantee that you don't ask non sequitur questions completely out of the blue. You know, oh, what was, that, what was that firm we were dealing with the other month? What? Firm, where, what, how, what? What are you talking about? Just random questions don't don't make any sense for people. You have a little conversational setup to them. That's how people work. Yeah. So the, the best way I know of doing setups is to talk them, dictate them. Don't try and type them. It's a different mode of thinking completely. So just dictate them and then edit them. And then once you, you've convinced you've got them as comprehensive and concise as you can do, then, you, then you've got a script. Okay? That's the first thing. The second thing is to genuinely start thinking about why candidates move, why companies choose to make a change in their arrangements. Don't just identify the towards stuff. Think about the trigger, the away from stuff. 
that brown stuff. Because there's always a combination. Okay? Why am I asking you to think about that? Because if you know all the benefits and you don't know the problems that made them act now instead of next week or next year or last year, chances are they won't. They won't make a change. Because anytime somebody changes now, they did it, they do it, because something's different now to five minutes ago or to last week. Otherwise, they'd have made a change last week. If they can get all these benefits now, well, they could probably have got them last week, but they didn't. Why not? What's changed? What's that trigger? That's, that's almost always an away from. Yeah? And the third one is just a silly thing, which is if you're listening to each other, if you're listening to yourself, which is always a tricky exercise, listening to yourself while you're talking, most people can't do it. Most people can only do one audio channel. But if you can listen to yourself while you're talking, or if you catch yourself, or if you catch your colleagues sounding really salesy, don't encourage them. Hit them with a stick or prod them with something or you know, kick them in the shin or something. Within the bounds of HR acceptability, obviously, within the HR policy and the bounds of taste and decency, because the more you sound like you're selling, the less you'll sell. Okay? So those are my three suggestions. Yeah? Um, if I had a three and a half, it would be all that stuff about the language. Okay? You can sound very confident. That hopefully, I sound like I know what I'm doing. So, yeah? A bit of feedback is good at this point. Yeah? Okay, I sound like I know what I'm doing, but I try not to give you absolutes. Try not to give you absolutes. Yeah? So I can sound confident. I can come across as a confident advisor who knows what they're doing without constantly wagging the finger and saying, this is the way things are. This is what you must do. This is what you have to. This is what you've got to. Yeah? Um, that little thing, by the way, that's called a modal operator. If you ever study anything to do with neuro linguistic programming, have to, got to, must, need to, should, want to. Those are all different ways of expressing an idea. Yeah? I'll give you two examples. Um, the first Mission Impossible movie, Ving Rhames lays out that they're on a train, Ving Rhames lays out the entire process of breaking into the CIA and nicking the file. Yeah? And Ving Rhames says, What? Well, and you think we can do this? And Tom Cruise, bless his little Scientology socks, turns around and says, we're going to do it. There's a huge difference between you think you can and you're going to. Yeah? All the difference in the world, they're not even close to being the same thing. So just be very much more aware of the way you use your words, particularly to yourself. Those words are spoken thoughts. Here endeth today's lesson, my brethren. Yeah? Right. Um, I'll see you on a week on Monday. Um, genuine op opinion, for those of you that have been attending the, the weekly coaching calls, I think a coaching call 6 o'clock on Thursday before we have a public holiday on a Friday, I think that's a really stupid idea. What do you reckon? We'll be oh, anyway, so, yeah, I'll bail on it then. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, it's just... Yeah, I'm just thinking about it and going like, I, well, I wouldn't turn up. Yeah, I wouldn't turn up, but I get paid for it. So it's kind of fair. Right. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.